Okay, good afternoon, folks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, today is our fifth lecture. Uh, and the last time, as you remember, we started looking at uh, different regimes of plane wave propagation in homogeneous media. And we overviewed uh, the concept of homogeneous waves, the concept of evanescent waves that are different regime of plane wave propagation uh with uh, exponentially decaying behavior we also studied we also learned uh the concept of longitudinal waves in media with zero permittivity or permeability we looked at what happens in media with negative refractive index double negative media with negative permittivity and permeability at the same time and we also touched upon uh, the plane wave propagation in anisotropic media which is described by the Fresnel's equation. We, we introduced the concept of isofrequency, which allows a nice graphical way of representing plane wave phase and energy propagation in anisotropic media. And we also looked, overviewed very briefly the exotic case of hyperbolic media, that's uh, anisotropic media that possess um, that are media with diagonal permittivity tensors that have different signs of different elements on the diagonal. And today uh, we're going to be looking uh, at what happens with plane waves when it, when it encounters a boundary as it propagates. So we're going to be looking at the problem of reflection or refraction that all of you probably are familiar with. Uh, the problem on the study is this. We have two semi-infinite media characterized by homogeneous media, characterized by some permittivity and permeability. Well, generally tensors, epsilon 1 mu 1 and epsilon 2 mu 2. And a plane wave is incident from the top uh, half space onto the interface, which is located at z equals zero. And the problem is to find what happens to this wave. Uh, what field, additional scattered field, this interface produces. Uh, and to begin with, uh, we will examine the case when both media, the lower medium and the, 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 the top medium and the bottom medium are simple isotropic medium characterized by diagonal permittivity tensors and permeability equal to one. In this case, will lead to the Fresnel formula that you're all familiar with. Now the Fresnel equation that we studied the last time. Fresnel equation describes isofrequency. So it describes the dispersion of plane waves in an infinite unbounded anisotropic medium. Fresnel formulas, on the other hand, describe the reflection transmission coefficients when a plane wave encounters a flat interface. Okay, so this is our incident wave whose uh, wave vector line lies, lies in the incidence plane. So the z-axis is directed from medium 2 to medium 1, x-axis is directed horizontally and it lies in the plane of the, of the figure and the wave vector of the incident wave lies in the same plane. It has the x component and the z component and it doesn't have any y components. And this, this defines the, the normal to the interface and the wave vector of the incident wave defines the incidence plane. And the wave vector in that medium satisfies the uh, simple dispersion uh, relationship where k is omega over c. Now, well, this is only the incident wave. We know that uh, the incident wave though on itself does not satisfy Maxwell's equations. And in order to satisfy Maxwell equations, we need to add two additional contributions that appear here. We need to add the transmitted wave, and we, we need to add the reflected wave, and we need essentially to satisfy the boundary conditions at the interface. Okay, so there are two additional waves that appear as the result of interaction between the incident field and the interface. So the interface, it is the interface that produces these two additional waves. Uh, these are two plane waves with some wave vectors. And because, because the system has translational invariance uh, along the X, in the XY plane, 
uh, that suggests that the wave vectors of the reflected and transmitted waves are as follows. The reflected wave flips its Z component, but it preserves the X component because of the trans translational invariance. Translational invariance always preserves the in-plane wave vector. And the transmitted wave is described by some different wave vector whose Z component is determined by the dispersion equation that we wrote previously. So these are the wave vectors. Now, these, these waves can have some polarization, right? They, they can have uh, polarization like this, maybe like this, or maybe some combination of it. So how do you handle uh, all possible polarizations of the incident wave? Uh, well, yeah, and before, before we go to uh, polarization, let us talk about a very simple consequence of uh, this super, of this um, uh, of this emergence of reflected and transmitted wave. If we write the relationship between, if you look at the relationship between the, the wave vectors of the incident and uh, refracted transmitted wave, and if we express the uh, different components of the wave vector via the incidence angle, then we can obtain nothing else but the Snell's law in its classical form, which states that the ratio of uh, sinuses of incidence and transmission angles equals to the reverse ratio of refractive indices of the two media, which works only for isotropic media. For anisotropic media, this is much more complicated. So we're gonna address this case briefly at the end of the first part. By, and by the way, N1 here is of course epsilon one. One and and two is epsilon two me two. This lecture was composed in a rush, so unfortunately there's going to be a number of a uh, number of typos and uh, inaccuracies, which uh, I hope to fix during during my talk. So this is the Snell's law as you know it from uh, school from high school uh, physics classes, and as you see, the Snell's law uh, is a consequence of the fact that the in-plane components of the wave vector is preserved. This, along with the dispersion relation of the plane wave here and here, automatically allows us to obtain this law without any geometric optics. Okay? So this is just the consequence of the wave nature of, uh, of light and dispersion relation. Okay, so now we need to deal with the polarization of light. Uh, how, how are we going to do this? Well, as long as both media are isotropic, simple isotropic media, this is done relatively easily. Uh, we can always split any plane wave into two polarization components that are defined with respect to our interface and the incidence plane. And these are the familiar S and P polarizations. So S polarization is defined as the polarization state whose electric field is perpendicular to the incidence plane. And this is going to be our Y uh, components in terms of the, of the Cartesian uh, coordinate system that we're dealing with, that we're working in. Uh, the S polarization is simply parallel to the Y axis. And P polarization is uh, what's left if when we subtract the S polarization, we're going to be left with a field that is polarized perpendicular to the wave vector and to the S component. And this is the unit vector that describes the P polarization state, which is determined by S and also the incident wave vector. So this is simply the vector product that makes sure that that P polarization is perpendicular to the wave vector. Now we can project our incident fields onto these two polarizations. And the very nice property of isotropic materials and interfaces between isotropic media is that they do not mix the two polarization states. So S remains S polarized, always remains S polarized uh, when interacting with an interface between two simple isotropic media. The transmitted wave, reflected wave, it is going to be S polarized. And P polarized wave is going to be P polarized. So this allows us to decouple, to split these two problems into S and P polarization and treat them separately and completely independently one by one. So first we address 
the first one. Next, we're going to address another one. And then we simply, due to the linearity of the proposition principle, we're going to add them up together. And we're going to obtain the full state of the complete transmitted field and the state, the full state of the complete uh, reflected field. Uh, okay, now basically we need to start thinking how to obtain these, uh, the electric fields of uh, these reflected and transmitted fields. Uh, so we're going to write the reflected and transmitted uh, field amplitudes as this. For S polarization, for S, what's wrong? Okay, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, for S polarization, we're going to relate the electric fields because remember that for S polarization, it is the electric field that has only one, uh, one vector component. It has the Y component, Y Cartesian component. So it's convenient to relate electric fields of the reflected and transmitted waves for S polarization. And for P polarization, the situation is opposite. It is the magnetic field that has only a single Cartesian component. The magnetic field of P polarized wave in this, in this uh, local geometry has only Y polarized components. And so it makes it con convenient to, for P polarization to relate the magnetic fields of the plane waves of the, of the reflected wave and of the transmitted wave. And now we're going to need to find these uh, four guys two transmission coefficients for S and for P, which relate to the electric fields and the magnetic fields. And remember, these, these are just scalars. They're not vectors. They are scalars. They are the Y components of the polarization vectors, which is why we can characterize this conversion by simple scalar amplitudes. And the same for reflection. Uh, this is important to emphasize because in some uh, literature, in some textbooks, it is not always clear well, for S polarization, it is always the electric field. For P polarization, it is not always clear if, uh, if the others uh, mean, if they imply uh, conversion for magnetic fields or if they are talking about some amplitudes that relate the electric field. For example, you could relate the Z component of the electric field. Let's say we have a P polarized, P -polarized incident wave which is incident on the interface. And this is our E, P. And this is going to be our reflected field. This is K reflected, and this is E reflected, P. And sometimes what the others would do is that they would consider this Cartesian component, the Z component uh, of the incident field. And they would relate this to the Z component of this field of this wave, which is E reflected P Z. And that's a mess. I think in Novotny, in principles of non-optics, uh, this is how they introduce the reflection coefficients for P polarization. I might be wrong. You might want to double check that, but I think uh, they, introduce, they introduce reflection coefficients for P polarization. So it is important to realize what exactly your reflection transmission coefficients relate. Is it electric field, magnetic field, or something else, pointing vectors, I don't know, some effective parameters. So now, well, we need to find the expressions for, this, for these coefficients. And there is no other way to find these expressions other than uh, impose the continuity conditions at the interface. And it suffices to impose continuity conditions for the tangential component of the electric field and for the tangential component of the magnetic field. That's all you need to impose. And, uh, and uh, by doing that, I'm, I'm going to skip the technical details. We obtain the desired reflection transmission coefficients, first for S polarization, where KZ1 and KZ2 are the Z components of the wave vector in the first and in the second medium, which are determined from the dispersion relations. And mu1 and mu2 are uh, permeabilities of the media, 
Uh, in optics, we are often dealing with uh, non-magnetic media. So these guys vanish, and we're left with a very simple expression. And T is simply 1 plus 1 plus R. If, as long as this coefficient expresses the relationship between electrical components, this is just 1 plus R. And very similar, in a, in a similar way, we obtain uh, expressions for P polarization, where instead of mu, we, we simply uh, flip mu's with epsilons, and we obtain a pair of uh, reflection transmission coefficients for P polarizations that relate the transverse magnetic field components. Uh, any questions so far? Where? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it is plus, it is plus, because, because we have uh, some field here, and this is Z equals zero, and we have the field here. So the electric field is tangential, which means that electric field here is uh, E. E incident plus R E incident. This is the polarization of reflected field. And on this side, it is C. So this is S. C S. This goes away, and we get T equals 1 plus R. The same for P polarization, but you relate magnetic fields. Uh, uh, if you were dealing with P polarization, but with the electric field, there is a chance that you would obtain minus instead of plus here. But this is why it is a mess. If people want to describe uh, the, if people want to relate the electric field components, for example, the Z components of the electric fields for P polarization, this becomes a mess, and you would have a minus here because uh, because electric field and magnetic field they would have different signs in uh, in the reflected plane wave. Uh, we can rewrite these expressions in a different form that in some cases becomes more convenient and this is done by introducing the concept of admittance. So an admittance of an isotropic medium is simply this combination. Uh, this is familiar to impedance, which is, which is just vice versa, which is epsilon divided by mu. This is the admittance. It is the permittivity of if uh, medium times permit permeability of vacuum divided by the same product of permittivity. So this is called that admittance, and this is actually comes this comes from uh, microwave and uh, electrical circuit engineering. This concept is used very widely in those areas, mm, less often in optics, but sometimes it comes in very handy. And in particular, let's see how how it comes into play uh, in. Uh, in reflection transmission coefficients in the, in the problem of reflection by an interface. So we just take our formulas that we had on the previous slide and we write them using the admittances. Uh, so we need to express all the wave vectors by the incidence angle. Then we take into account the Snell's law and we write everything in terms of these admittances and we obtain this. So in this formula, we have admittances, uh, y, y1, y2, we have only the incidence angle. We don't have the transmission angle because the transmission angle is basically this. The transmission angle here is expressed in terms of the incidence angle and refractive indices. So as soon as you know refractive indices, as soon as you know the admittances of both media and you know the incidence angle theta, you know everything. You know RS, TS, RP, TP. That solves your problem for isotropic media. Exactly, we're gonna we're gonna address this very soon. Yeah. Uh, so these these the complex these amplitudes that we obtain they are complex numbers and they relate the electrical magnetic field amplitudes. But more often, especially in the context of of uh, various experiments, we are interested in power reflection transmission coefficients. So this is what we often would have in practice. We have some interface here. We have 
air, and we have some dielectric refractive index and tube. And this is our laser beam, which is incident onto the, the interface. And we have a detector here. And the detector is usually located uh, in parallel with the interface. And we're interested in how much power goes through that detector, gets into that detector. So mathematically, this is expressed by the integral of the point vector. One half E times H conjugated D, uh, Dn, where Dn is the uh, element of the surface area. Uh, so th this is how much point vector goes normally, how much intensity of light, how much flux goes into this detector. Okay, so we need to know uh, to, to be able to tell uh, how much intensity goes into this detector, we need to calculate the Z component of the point vector. First, we need to calculate the point vector of the transmitted field of the reflected field, because we, we might also have a detector here. And then we need to calculate the Z component of the point vector, integrate that of the area and compare with the incident intensity. Uh, and uh, this is how we calculate these quantities. We may recall that in isotropic medium, the point vector can be very simply expressed through the electric field, uh, electric field magnitude and the impedance of the medium. Uh, and then we calculate the Z component of the point vector. And this leads to the following power reflection and transmission amplitude for S polarization and for P polarization. So the power uh, reflection coefficient is always just the absolute, the squared absolute value of the reflection amplitude. This is easy, but for transmission, it is not too simple. It is more tricky, as you can see, because so why why this happens? Why expression? Why is the expression for transmission power coefficient is so much more cumbersome? Well, because the point vector of the incident wave is directed like this, and the point vector of the transmitted wave is directed onto a different angle, but the detector is still uh, parallel to the interface. So we need to calculate this ratio. Uh, we, we need to project both point vectors onto the normal, and this is done differently. And then we also need to take into account the relationship between electric and magnetic fields in different media. And this is why this, these two ratios appear in these expressions. This one and this one. They, they include all this dependence of the, of the point vector on the angle and on the medium parameters. And this is what you obtain in experiment. In experiment, you don't obtain this or this. You obtain these absolute uh, real valued magnitudes. Unless, unless you work in the microwave with vector network analyzer, where it is indeed possible to obtain not the power reflection transmission scattering coefficients, but real complex valued transmission and reflection amplitudes, which are in microwave called S parameters. There it is possible because the fields are relatively slowly oscillating, unlike optics, and it is possible to measure the real uh, transmission reflection coefficients, not just power, power, uh, power coefficients. Okay, so now let's explore a couple of interesting possibilities that we can have uh, in this phenomenon of reflection and transmission. First, let us explore the Brewster uh, angle that Shinoxi mentioned. Uh, let us consider incidence of a plane wave from uh, vacuum or air at an angle theta onto a lossless dielectric with permittivity epsilon 2. And it is very easy to see that uh, as long as the incidence angle satisfies this simple uh, expression, this condition, the reflection coefficient will exactly vanish. It is very easy to do after simple algebra. So Rp becomes identically exactly zero. There is no reflection. All electromagnetic wave is perfectly transmitted to the second medium without reflection, <clears throat> this is called Brewster angle. 
Brewster phenomenon, Brewster angle. Brewster phenomenon is generally violated as soon as you have any, any absorption in the medium. Absorption in the medium, as we know from, from the Pointing theorem, is described by an imaginary component of the, of the permittivity, as, as long as permittivities are isotropic. And it is easy to see that if epsilon 2 has a non-zero imaginary part, positive corresponding to dissipation or negative corresponding to gain, we're going to be talking about gain uh, sometime in the future. This cannot be zero. This always will be non-zero. However, if the medium is anisotropic, if there is an anisotropy, for example, the permittivity along the z-axis differs from the xy permittivities, which can be isotropic. There is still a possibility to, to suppress the reflection coefficient of a p-polarized wave by accurately engineering the anisotropy of this material, even in the presence of losses. Um, so this is an example of the Brewster angle, uh, when a p-polarized plane wave is incident onto is incident from air onto I think glass with a refractive index of 1.45, uh, and in the log scale you can clearly see that uh, reflection coefficient drops to zero at a particular incidence angle determined by this simple condition. And we don't often talk about microscopic interpretation of electromagnetics in this uh, in this class, but I figure it is very important and instructive to provide a simple microscopic interpretation of the Brewster phenomenon, which goes as follows. Uh, again, this is our interface with some permittivity epsilon 2. This is our p-polarized wave incident at an angle beta at the interface. So how what is what is the structure what does this wave do with this medium well it induces certain dipoles in this medium it induces polarization and polarization is just a bunch of molecules so atoms or electrons that are polarized by the fields in this medium so from the snell's law we can calculate this the angle of transmission which is related by the snell's law to the incidence angle and because the wave remains p-polarized, we know that the polarization in this, in this medium will be directed uh, perpendicularly to the wave vector. Okay? Uh, but it happens so that when you hit, and, and we know that dipoles, these dipoles, so every each uh, every of these arrows is just one tiny dipole that is induced in our medium that we now describe microscopically. So every dipole uh, radiates, and this radiation dipole is basically the origin of the reflected wave, which goes under the same angle theta in, in air. And it happens so that exactly at the Brewster angle, the direction of this dipole, it is obviously not the case here. I draw this diagram wrong. I should have launched my incident wave onto, onto an angle that exceeds 45 degrees. Because 45 degrees is what you obtain with epsilon 2 equals 1. Uh, it, it, it should have more oblique incidence. Then that would make sense. But it, it happens so for the Brewster angle, the reflected wave, the direction of the reflected wave exactly aligns with the axis, with the axis of all these microscopic dipoles that we induce in uh, in the in the second medium, but because dipoles do not radiate along their axis, right? Because if you have a point dipole, we know that the radiation pattern of a dipole is this eight-shaped thing, right? Sine square or cosine squared theta, something like this. And the dipole cannot radiate along this direction, right? So this is a microscopic interpretation. Without even calculating reflection coefficient, you can say that as soon as you eliminate your medium at this uh, angle, you cannot produce reflected wave because dipoles of the medium do not radiate at this particular angle. And so simply formation of the reflected wave is uh, forbidden. 
Uh, another interesting situation is the total internal reflection. Now, situation is somewhat op opposite. Now we are incident from a more optically dense medium onto less optically dense medium, not necessarily air, but something that has a smaller, smaller per permittivity. And uh, as soon as the angle of incidence, as soon as this angle, theta exceeds the critical angle, which is determined by this condition, this should be epsilon 1 over epsilon 2. The transmitted wave becomes evanescent. This is going to be our transmitted wave. This is our transmitted wave. It is the evanescent wave. Uh, and the evanescent waves, as you remember from our first lecture, they do not transfer energy in this direction, uh, along the, the attenuation direction. And so energy has nowhere else to go but to be reflected back completely in its entirety. So there, will, there is going to be some field, some evanescent field in the second medium, in, in epsilon 1, which, is, uh, which can be, for example, air, but all the energy is going to be reflected back. For all angles exceeding the angle, the critical angle of total internal reflection. Uh, and on the right plot, you can see an example calculated for incidents from, I guess, glass onto air. And you can see that reflection achieves unity uh, very rapidly at a certain angle. And then it makes a very sharp turn and continues to be one for every angle. And this phenomenon uh, is polarization independent, unlike Brewster angle, because for any polarization for S, for P, the, the uh, transmitted wave is going to be evanescent respective of the polarization state. Again, in the presence of losses in the second medium, this is going to be violated because some energy now will, will penetrate into this medium and it, it's going to be absorbed in this medium. Some part of the energy that depends on the impedance mismatch and on the, on the amount of dissipation of this medium. And the amount of reflected light is going to be less than unity. So it's going to go something like this. Okay? Uh, and ideal total internal reflection is only possible in any absence of dissipation. Uh, now let's talk very briefly about the case of anisotropic media. It is a bit more complicated and it is not... Uh, always considered in uh, textbooks. It is somewhat more special, but I want to go over the anisotropic case just, just briefly. And to begin with, I want to consider a particular case of anisotropic media. I, I call this case the aligned case, the case of aligned anisotropic media. And this case realizes when both media, they can be anisotropic uh, with some uh, permittivity tensors, but the, L, the tensors are diagonal in our coordinate system, which is, uh, which is connected with the incidence plane and the interface plane. And I require, I request that the permittivity tensors of both media, permittivity and permeability, are diagonal in this basis, in the coordinate system of X, Y, and Z. And this case, allows us to treat this problem relatively easily. Now we can have, we can again split our field, incident field into two polarizations, into, into S polarization, which, is, which represents transverse electric field, and P polarization, which represents uh, transverse magnetic fields. These two polarizations now, they generally will have different wave vectors which are determined by the Fresnel equation, but these wave vectors, they may differ, unlike the case of isotropic medium. Because now for every medium, you're going to have its own uh, isofrequency, kx, ky, kz, and you're going to have maybe you have one uh, ellipsoid, and you have some sphere inside, as for the case of a uniaxial dielectric or with birefringence, so maybe you have something more complicated. But generally, you'll, you'll have two different solutions, two different wave vectors for S and for P polarization. And then, uh, in, this, in this case, the 
uh, S and P polarization, they again can be treated independently of each other. Uh, and we can obtain uh, reflection transmission coefficients independently that have very similar form uh, to the case of simple isotropic media, but with only difference that permittivities that enter the formulas, the expressions for P polarization are not the scalar permittivities, but the particular, but particular components of the permittivity tensors, the particular components that are felt by the electric fields of the traveling uh, incident and transmitted wave. Uh, so, in principle, it is also possible to solve this problem for non-aligned anisotropic media when the tensors, permittivity, permeability tensors, are not diagonal in the coordinate system that is connected, that is defined by the in interface and by the incidence plane. But the problem becomes much more messier because now we cannot split the problem into independent S and P polarization and treat them independently. So S polarization will couple with P polarization and it will pr pr produce both S and P reflected, S and P transmitted waves. Even if only one medium, even on, only if only this medium is an isotropic epsilon 2, and this may be air, if we have an incident S polarized field, then generally we're going to have two transmitted waves uh, with different wave vectors, different amplitudes. And if I'm not mistaken, we're also generally going to have two reflected waves. We're going to have uh, S, but also P polarized wave in this, in this medium. And these, these processes can be described by reflection transmission matrices that express the relationship between that express the conversion of S into S and P, P into S and P, and so on and so forth. And the problem is much more complicated. I'm not going to describe, describe this interaction now, but it can all be found in specialized textbooks in, and papers. And b before, before we finish the first part of today's class, let me uh, describe you a very simple graphical way of estimating the reflection and refraction phenomena and estimating the energy flow upon refraction in a complicated anisotropic media. So to do that, we first draw, we, we determine our incidence plane and we draw the isofrequency, the cut, the projection of the isofrequency onto our incidence plane. And we do draw the isofrequency of our top medium, which in this case is assumed to be air, so the isofrequency of air is a sphere and projection of that isofrequency is the circle. And we also draw the isofrequency, the isofrequency contour of the second medium, which can be anything else. It can be a sphere, it can be an ellipsoid, it can be something more complicated. It can be two isofrequencies, for example, in the case of a bi, uh, even in the case of a uniax material. So we're going to have one sphere and one ellipsoid here. And then we do this. After we plot two isofrequencies together, we make a vertical cut with a particular k parallel, which is the in-plane wave vector component of our incident wave. So we know at which angle, we know the angle at which the wave is incident onto the interface. So this is our k parallel right here. And we make a vertical cut. And we connect zero to the point of intersection where this vertical cut intersects our uh, air isofrequency. And this will determine, of course, the wave vector of the incident wave in air. This is simply the dispersion relation of our wave in air. But now we continue this vertical cut until it crosses the second isofrequency or both isofrequencies if, if you have two. And this will determine the Z component of the wave vector in the second medium, okay, right here. If you have two isofrequencies, for example, in the case of uniaxial or biaxial material, you're going to have two intersection points. 
And then what you do is you plot the normal to the either frequency at that point. And as you remember, the group velocity, the group velocity in an anisotropic medium is, can you remind me what it is, the group velocity? In a, yeah, it is the partial uh, derivative d omega over dk, which is a normal to the either frequency. And so the normal to that either frequency will tell you the way in which the point vector, the intensity of light will flow, will propagate in the second medium. And if you have two either frequencies, you're going to have two intersection points, and the normal at, that po at those points will tell you the direction in which the energy will propagate. And this is exactly the direction in which you will see the propagation of a light ray with, uh, with your eye. Uh, so now let's have a break, and after the break we discuss the transfer matrix method. Okay, let's um, now switch gears and talk about the transfer matrix method. The transfer matrix method is, uh, is a tool that now allows us to generalize the problem that we were treating in, in, in the first part, to generalize it to a number of interfaces and films between them. Let's say we have a multi-layer, a stack of n films, with uh, thicknesses L and permittivities epsilon illuminated by some plane wave. S polarized or P polarized incident at some angle theta on this stack of films. And our problem is to find the reflected and transmitted fields produced by this structure. We will be assuming that the stack is formed by a series of isotropic dielectric films uh, that will allow us, again, to completely treat independently propagation of S and P polarized fields through the stack and solve the problems, just the problems, completely independently. General, generalization, in the case of isotropic media, will be discussed uh, briefly in the end. So we have the transmitted field, the reflected field, you have N films, and in principle, from the previous, we know what happens to, to each plane wave at every interface between this large number of films in the system, but we, we, we need to find a self-consistent solution that takes into account all the films in the system, and we want this recipe to be more or less general, so we could easily incorporate n plus one, n plus two films in the system without redoing the whole, the whole uh, the whole approach to, to solving the problem. So we would have at our disposal something gen general, generic, that produces a formula, a, a way to calculate reflection transmission coefficients given uh, a set of n films with particular thicknesses and permittivities. And this is the essence of the transfer matrix method. So in each, in every film, the, we, we will be considering the S-polarized case uh, without loss of generality. The case of P-polarization will be considered absolutely analogously. Uh, so in every film now, the, the fields can be, reproduced, can, be, uh, can be represented as a, as a superposition of forward propagating and backward propagating wave. There is nothing else. Interaction of plane wave with each interface will produce transmitted and reflected wave, and so on and so forth. These waves will, will be bouncing back and forth, and every time they, they will produce exactly this pair of one transmitted, one reflected wave. And so, in every layer, we can, in principle, uh, the, uh, represent the fields as electric and magnetic fields as a superposition of forward, backward propagating waves. And then, what we have to do? Well, we have to impose continuity conditions at every interface solve the, the system of equations, self-consistently determine all this E plus E minus, H plus N minus in every, every layer, and that will give us the transmitted field on the right, reflected field on the left. But this requires solution of a linear system uh, 2N times 2N, right? If you have N films, you have uh, N plus 1 interfaces, and at each interface you have reflected and transmitted uh, field. So this is a lot, and we don't want to do that. But luckily there is 
uh, the method that allows to run all these to, to perform all these uh, all these boundary conditions and to satisfy all these boundary conditions in a very simple way without solving uh, 2n times 2n system of linear equations. So what we do is that we break down the system, the stack of films into primitive elements. Let's say this is our beginning. This is our beginning, or this is or this is just n minus one. And this is an interface between n and minus one and nth field. And this is the next interface. And this is the field of thickness L n. And what we do is that on each side of the field, and therefore on each side of the interface, we write, we expand the field as a superposition of forward propagating and backward propagating wave. Okay? Uh, and as long as we are dealing with S polarization, these coefficients, they express the magnitude uh, of the electric field. So we have AN and BN on the right hand side of every interface and we have C and DN on every side on the side of every on the left side of every interface and now what we need to do is that we need to establish the linear relationships from here to here we need to be able to go from here to here and also we need to be able to go from here to here okay so we need two kinds of linear relationships that connect this this vector of uh, electric field amplitude across the field and across the interface and these are two qualita qualitatively different problems which we need to solve separately so first we're going to address this kind of relationship when we relate the fields on the left side of the field to the fields on the right hand side across the field and this is very easy because there is no reflection happening inside the field. The forward propagating wave just goes forward and backward propagating wave just goes backward without any reflection. Okay, so the matrix is simply diagonal because there is no reflection. And this guy expresses the phase factor that the forward propagating wave acquires. And this factor expresses the phase delay that the backward propagating wave acquires as it propagates across the layer. And this is it. This, this, this operator, this linear matrix expresses exactly what we wanted. It expresses this connection for every field. Just every time, every time you have to plug in the correct thickness, L, theta, and the correct wave vectors, Kz plus, Kz minus, which uh, is determined, of course, by the dispersion relation of plane wave in a particular field. And that's it. That, that gives you the transfer matrix of the field. But there is another kind of transfer matrix that we also need to establish for the interface that connects, that connects these things to those things. And this is something similar, right? This is just what we addressed previously on the first part of the class with only difference. We had one incident wave and we had the transmitted and reflected wave. Here we also have the incident from the other side. But this is very easy. We just need to launch this additional wave from the other side. And this will give us the desired answer. So what we want, what we know, what we know is this, is the relationship between B and C to A and D. Because A and D here in this picture are incident waves. And B and C can be really expressed through the Fresnel coefficients which we just calculated previously. This is reflection coefficient uh, upon incidence from I to J medium. This is reflection from the opposite side. And these are transmission coefficients. So this, this whole matrix can be constructed by using uh, formulas that we obtained just half an hour ago. How do you obtain from this? Remember that we need to express C and D via A and B. Well, this is, uh, this is just a linear relationship, so we can flip some of the uh, vector elements inside this relationship, and we can move, uh, so we want to have C and D, so we move B here, and we move D 
here. And of course the matrix changes, but that's uh, that's a first year problem, first year exercise. You, you can do this easily just by changing, reconstructing the matrix. And this is how the results of the matrix looks like. Now it expresses C and D, the waves on the right, via A and B, the waves amplitudes on the left. This is exactly what you wanted. And all this you already know because these are Fresnel reflection and transmission coefficients that you can easily calculate once you know permittivities on each side of the interface. Well, that's it, basically. Uh, now we need to recover the entire system. So now our system of N films, it becomes a network, a one-dimensional network, essentially, of consecutive cells. These are the cells, and each cell represents a particular transfer matrix. It can be a transfer matrix that connects two interfaces. For example, the interface between zero media uh from which the field is incident in the system and the first media and this is the transfer matrix t1 which is the homogeneous transfer matrix which expresses propagation of the fields across a, a homogeneous field and this is our exit side where we have some incident fields and we don't have any incident field from this side because remember we want to establish the reflection and transmission coefficients and what we do? Well, we're going to have to just multiply these matrices starting from this side. Why? Because, because we're going to act with this matrix on whatever, whatever is here, the, the incident and the reflected field. This is how transfer matrices work. They take whatever is on the left side and then return you the set of amplitudes on the right side of the element. And on the right side the element, on the right hand side of the system is this. This is what we want to determine. And this is what we have at the beginning. So we start multiplying from this side. We take T01, T1, and so on and so forth. And uh, we remember to combine, to combine these matrices in the correct order. So after every uh, interface matrix, a homogeneous matrix follows and so on and so forth. And this gives us the resulting matrix of the entire system. Uh, and now when we have this entire matrix of the full system, we can finally calculate the desired reflection and transmission coefficients of the entire stack that we were looking for from the beginning. So we write this vector a and b as 1 and r. r because 1 because the incident field is unity and r is the reflection coefficient and cd is transmission coefficient and 0 d equals 0 because there is no incidence from the right we uh, the, because these two vectors are related by the total transfer matrix of the system that we calculated previously we can express r and c just by transferring t to this side and by moving one to the side, and we express the reflection and transmission coefficients through the matrix elements of this full matrix. This is it. This is the answer to the problem. And like I said, this uh, recipe can be generalized to a stack of anisotropic matrices, but the result is much more cumbersome because every time you have an interface, will be coupling between S and P polarization. So the matrices, instead of being uh, two by two matrices, they're gonna be four by four because you're gonna have uh, on every side of the interface, you're gonna have forward propagating S, forward propagating P, backward propagating S, backward propagating P. And these four things will be in a linear way connected to the same vector of four elements on the other side of the interface. And this is very, very messy, but in principle it has been done and it is possible to run a very similar routine and obtain the set of resulting uh, one, two, three, eight, eight reflection coefficients that express the total uh, reflection and transmission, the total reflected and transmitted fields 
for both polarizations and accounts for cross polarization effects. And if you're wondering, uh, you can find the, the details uh, here. So this is it for today. Actually, we did it very quickly uh, with the transfer matrix. Uh, and this is the things that you should remember from today's class, that the reflection and refraction uh, ref reflection and transmission by an interface, the Snell flow, the phenomena of Brewster angle and total internal reflection, and the transfer matrix method. That is all. Thank you for your attention and for your time.